from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Musk's skepticism about bots on Twitter has one investor now suing the company for more information. More on the threats to blow up the $44 billion buyout this hour. Plus, the future of flying cars. Our own Ed Ludlow on the ground at Up Summit in Bentonville, Arkansas, where mobility tech leaders and investors have gathered. He will bring us an exclusive interview with Joe B. Aviation CEO later this hour. And my exclusive conversation with a firm CEO, Max Levchin, on the heels of Apple announcing it is offering a competing version of buy now, pay later. We're going to get to all of that in a moment, but first I want to get a look at the markets. Apple and Microsoft driving shares higher despite a pullback in Target and Amazon. Blueworks Katie Greifeld with us now for more. Katie, take it away. Well, Emily, like you said, it was a real risk on day, largely thanks to tech. You saw a lot of buying energy just in the last hour of trading. The S&P 500 and the Nasdaq 100 both finishing about 1% higher, give or take a tenth of a percent there. As a result, you saw volatility markets really breathe a sigh of relief. You have the VIX there uh, at 24 almost below it, something to watch in the days to come. And Bitcoin, this is interesting, even though you did see a resurgence in some of those big tech names, not as much love for Bitcoin, didn't really keep up with that rally though. The coin did trade above $31,000 a coin. We'll see if it can continue to break higher, but I'm still thinking about Twitter, honestly. The news yesterday, of course, Elon Musk threatening to end the deal to buy Twitter over data over bots. Uh, that caused the shares to drop 1.5% yesterday. Today, they basically gave back all of those losses. Twitter shares now just about flat on the week, about a tenth of a percent lower. But still, Twitter shares, even with that gain that you saw today, they're trading around $40 per share, a couple of cents above that. If you look at the spread to Elon Musk's offer price, of course, at $54.20 a share is still quite a spread there, just over $14 between those two prices. It was even larger back in May, but still a lot of daylight between those two prices, Emily. All right, Bloomberg Katie Greifeld, thank you. An update now on Twitter and this Elon Musk saga. Twitter shareholder has sued the company in Delaware. John Solak, who owns five shares of Twitter, wants a judge to force the social media platform to hand over internal files about spam and fake accounts. This has become a hot button issue in Elon Musk's $44 billion potential buyout. Max Chafskin joins us now with more. So this on the back of the Texas Attorney General also opening investigation into this spot issue, Max. How are these going to potentially impact the deal? You know, when, when this uh, deal first started back in March and, and the Twitter executive team was so excited to have Elon Musk and all of his meme stock, you know, followers on board, um, you know, we're seeing the flip side of that, which is these lawsuits, which of course are about real issues, the bots, but also feel very much like follow on bandwagon, um, basically trying to find ways to back up the claims that Elon Musk has been trying to put forward. And, and it's probably important to say that these are claims that there's not a lot of basis for, in fact. There's, there's not a lot of reason beyond, you know, kind of Elon Musk's personal experience to think that Twitter's bot numbers are higher than that, you know, 5% figure that they've been disclosing all along. Right. Twitter says it's cooperating. Have they handed over the, the information that they have or not? I mean, the, the perception here is that they're trying to hide something. Right. Well, and that's what that's kind of where Elon Musk's lawsuit has has or, or his claims that are that he might be using to to, to wheedle his way out of this deal where, where he's landed, which is not that there are too many bots, but it's that Twitter is not, you know, disclosing properly. And this is going to be, you know, a long, uh, you know, a long dispute. Uh, there's lots of room for interpretation here, because, of course, the way that Twitter could you know, prove uh, that it doesn't have as many bots as Elon thinks th that it has would be to turn over its user data. But of course, you don't necessarily want to turn over all your user data, especially uh, not to somebody who's been kind of continuously like tweeting about the deal uh, si since it was announced. So, so you could definitely see reasons why Twitter would want to hold back to some extent. What are your, what do you think the odds are 
that this deal goes through. I mean, it doesn't feel likely, does it? And, you know, we're seeing uh, with that chart showing the big gap between the offer and Twitter's current share price. I mean, it, it really feels like Elon Musk is, is doing whatever he can uh, to, to either get out of this or at least at least get through it at a lower price. On the other hand, of course, we're seeing Twitter uh, saying, you know, we had a deal, you know, we're, we're, we're moving forward. So, so I suppose it's possible that this could, this could close, although it, it doesn't feel likely at the moment. All right. Now, you are also, in the meantime, covering Sheryl Sandberg's resignation from Meta. You still got a lot of people out there wondering why and why now. You're looking at her legacy, not just at, at Facebook and Google, but on the Internet, saying that she has left us with a future of targeted ads. Talk to us about her influence on the Internet at large. Yeah, and I think this has sort of been lost to some extent with her announcement that she was leaving. I think in part because of the way that Sheryl Sandberg chose to make that announcement. In her big farewell blog post, she talked about, you know, in 2007 when she first met Mark Zuckerberg, she thought of the internet as being this, you know, funny little place for, for searching for, you know, images, which of course is, is <laughs> totally crazy considering that Sheryl Sandberg for years had built Google into this advertising monolith. I mean, she was already a, you know, well-known, very influential executive who had been known for basically building the entire AdWords and AdSense business at Google, which are these personalized, data-driven ads. It's sort of like what we think of when we think of internet advertising. And Sheryl Sandberg was the one who was out there in front talking about how every business owner, you know, in the country needed to, to adopt this. And we saw her kind of uh, do the same thing at Facebook. And now as she kind of moved moves forward to her next act, I think this, this kind of creates a complication because her sort of biggest accomplishment, which was creating this kind of scaffolding of personalized ads that have generated, you know, billions of dollars across two companies, you know, that's suddenly much more controversial than it was before. It's, it's both kind of a, a feature, her, her greatest achievement, but also maybe a vulnerability as she, you know, moves to another job in, you know, in business or politics or wherever she lands in the future. Now, Apple has been adding more privacy-focused features. We saw more at WWDC yesterday. This has negatively impacted, hurt uh, Meta and Facebook's business model. Do you think targeted ads are eventually going away or really never or not anytime soon? Well, I mean, you know, that's hard to say. C clearly, Mark Zuckerberg thinks that, th that this is not the future. And I think if you look at, you know, why are Sheryl Sandberg and Mark Zuckerberg this, you know, wonderful partnership for 14 years, extremely lucrative for both parties, you know, why are they parting ways now? I think part of the reason is that um, Zuckerberg, you know, is obviously focused on this metaverse thing, which is going to be less dependent on advertising. And, and as you said, we have seen Apple um, create, you know, basically throw up barriers for, for companies like Meta to, you know, to, to track people across different websites. That said, just because Apple creates these privacy rules, it's not going to stop um, websites and companies from collecting what's known as first-party data. So that's data inside of Apple, data inside of Facebook. And, and these companies, these, these big tech giants, Apple, Meta, Google, and so on, they have tons of data. That is never going away. And, this, and targeted advertising is always going to be a huge business. The question is, you know, is it the growth business that it once was? And I think that is, is to be determined. All right. Bloomberg's Max Chafkin, thank you. Coming up, the IPO winter. Some call it the end of the era of free money with no return in sight. We'll have more on that next. Plus, tomorrow we're going to kick off our Bloomberg Technology Summit. The theme is looking forward. And we've got a host of some of the most powerful players in technology. I'm going to be sitting down with Amazon CEO Andy Jassy for an exclusive conversation. You don't want to miss it live right here on Bloomberg Television, 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 11.30 here on the West Coast. This is Bloomberg. This first six months have been the weakest first half for IPOs in years. How long will the slowdown in listings weigh on Wall Street and Silicon Valley and venture capital? I want to talk about all this and more with Initialize Capital general partner Alda Lou Dennis. Alda, great to have you here in the studio. Great to be here. Thank you. So we've seen Sequoia, Y Combinator, multiple firms come out with their version of RIP Good Times. What is Initialized's take? Well, you know, I think what we saw was the news sort of trickling down slowly to founders 
And I would say about a month and a half ago, I was hearing from a lot of LPs about the slowdown, and they were seeing it in their public markets and their books, uh, their public books, and VC sort of got the memo from their own LPs. And right now I'm having the conversation with our founders about how it really is looking like this is a downturn. There's still some denial uh, in those <laughs> ranks and um, some defenses about how particular businesses may be able to withstand that. But initial, initialize this take is that, yes, we are looking at a downturn and we shouldn't panic. Uh, we're seed stage investors, so we're in the business of taking chances on founders and hoping that they'll figure out their business models and uh, to conserve a little bit of capital for uh, the longer term. The big question is how big is the downturn going to be? Sure, and I don't think anyone has a crystal ball, but at, at least at the early stage at Seed Stage Investing, what we're really hoping is that they can find a product that people want and that mm -hmm. people will want to grab out of their hands. And at that stage, uh, we're always going to be in the business of taking those chances and pivoting quickly and trying to find something that people want. What are you seeing? Are fewer rounds closing right now or are founders saying, I'm not even going to try to fundraise oh, at this moment? Absolutely. I, I've been advising companies to delay, uh, you know, not to go out and rush and do a panic fundraise because I think that VCs are exhausted mm. from the last two years of really, really bullish markets. and. I know so many that are looking forward, myself included, to taking some time off this summer. And so it's not a great time unless you are already planning on fundraising anyway to sort of go out there and shake the trees for some more capital. So what should founders do if they need to extend their runway? Well, there's plenty of ways to cut costs that don't involve raising capital. Uh, and certainly um, there are leases that they may have that they could sublet. Uh, we actually just put out a blog post about how it's possible to um, uh, even cut maybe say a, a small percentage of your staff or cut everyone back by one day a week and that would reduce 20 percent of uh, of your labor expenses which tend to be you know seven seventy five percent of the overall budget that's interesting so you're advising layoffs is that well I wouldn't say that we're advising layoffs I think we were are advising to not panic take time to prepare if you actually need to raise capital and prepare your story and think about some cost cutting measures that may not involve laying off including um, cutting back on expenses like snacks or cutting back on uh, uh, retreats for those companies that have gone remote or cutting back on offices. But suggesting that employee, employers cut employees from five to four days a week, that's interesting. I haven't heard of that before. And it's certainly tell, something. You, tell me more about that idea. Yeah. Are you, you talking know, employees across the board? Are you talking about contractors? I think it depends on the teams that are involved. But certainly, um, I think that we could afford to uh, cut a certain amount of days or cut everyone's salary proportionally and most employees would be happy to accept that because if it was look them looking at the face of getting cut entirely or 20 percent of their workforce getting cut versus taking an across the board pay cut which my husband's company did during uh, the start of COVID uh, they, they accepted it and they were happy that uh, the cuts weren't deeper. What, what company was that? Uh, I, I don't know if I can disclose <laughs> on TV, and, uh, but uh, but they've they've come out of the, the they've come out of COVID just fine as, as many companies right. did. So let's talk about what Initialize is looking for in the road ahead. I mean, are you still looking at? Uh, in, are you are you still putting money out now or not? Have you also paused your investing? No, I mean we're in the business of. Being optimists, we're in the business of looking, company, looking for companies, and I've had the benefit of being an investor and being in this market through a couple of downturns. Mm -hmm. And so absolutely, we're still looking at pitches, we're still talking to founders, but I do think it's true that uh, I personally was very, very busy over the last couple of years and looking forward to taking some time off as my kid's school ends on Friday. Hmm. Um, so when you look ahead, what are the sectors, the bets, the trends that you think are actually going to flourish in this market? Like, What are you most excited about? There's a lot of different sectors that I'm excited about. Um, I think that, for one, I'm interested in the markets that appeal to um, you know, consumers that may not have received um, software uh, transformations in their businesses. Another industry that I'm interested in is sort of beauty. I think that's one that uh, has stood up well in, in historical downturns. Um, and 
generally appeals to uh, more female or underrepresented groups of the population as far as consumer investments go. And um, you know, I can't, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our funds focus on sort of crypto and Web3 technologies, which is one that we're still actively pursuing. Well, we've talked to Gary Tan ad, ad nauseum, your partner about those. Um, thank you for, for sharing your view on all that's happening with us, Initialize Capital General Partner, Alta Lou. Well, they were once bitter rivals, but now Waymo and Uber are teaming up. The companies have just announced what they are calling a deep long-term partnership. Waymo will connect its autonomous trucking operation to Uber Freight. This comes just a few months after the companies ended a drawn-out legal battle over self-driving technology. Waymo's trucking service, Waymo Via, is expected to be running on Uber Freight's network within the year. And what timing? Both Uber CEO Dara Khosrowshahi and Waymo co-CEO Takedra Mawakana will be joining us at the Bloomberg Tech Summit tomorrow. Mawakana will be sitting down right here with me on the show as well. Coming up, we're going to get a status update on Air Taxis, an exclusive interview with Joby Aviation and our own Ed Ludlow joining us from a summit on the future of transportation. Ed. That's right, Em. We're on the ground, but we're also up in the air. We're talking all things that fly, all things that are electric, all things that are mobility. This is Bloomberg. to the Up Summit in Bentonville, Arkansas, our own Ed Ludlow, live on the ground at this invite-only gathering of mobility tech CEOs, investors, and startups. That is over $1 trillion of assets in the room. He's joined now by a special guest, Ed. Yeah, and it's one guy that everyone wants to speak to, Joe Ben Bivitt, CEO of Joby Aviation. We're rubbing shoulders with all kinds of people here, right? We have investors, we have other CEOs, we have corporates that want to collaborate with CEOs. What are you talking to people about? What's your message right now? So what's really exciting right now, this is an amazing event. It's a convergence of uh, amazing uh, CEOs and leaders from around the world right. who are really focused on sustainable aviation and how do we reduce the impact on our environment from aviation. We're talking electric vertical takeoff and landing, flying, I call it flying taxi, right? Let's call it what it is, flying taxi. Where are you in your cycle at Joby Aviation for making this real? Because that's the other conversation that's happening here in the corridors, right? A lot of this seems a long way in the future. Yeah, so we've been working on this for more than a decade. Uh, this is a really fantastic future and it's uh, coming true today. We've, we've been flying full-scale aircraft since 2017. Right. We've been certifying them with the FAA since 2018. We've had really exciting news just today on additional progress with the FAA on our certification program. So the momentum is really building. So it sounds like you, you have a pretty high opinion of the FAA and the work, the pace that they're doing things. I've heard from others that are kind of frustrated with the FAA because of how restricted they are. But but you're happy with where things stand from a regulatory standpoint. The FAA has done an incredible job in. Uh, with industry over decades right. to make aviation the safest mode of transportation that we have. It's orders of magnitude safer than uh, any other mode we have, and that's really, really exciting, and that's what the FAA's mission is. Talk to me about the aircraft themselves. Where are we in production? What is the target for production over, say, the next few months, the next year? So we've, we've just completed our pilot production facility. This gives us the, the ability to produce tens of aircraft per year. Okay. Um, we are. We have a close partnership with Toyota, and right. uh, we are uh, working with them on the plans for our Phase One production facility, which will be able to produce hundreds of aircraft per year. So, what is the idea there? That you you work with Toyota to learn from their experience in manufacturing, you, or you use their facilities? How does that play out in practice? Yeah. So, Toyota's amazing. They're they're known around the world uh, for being able to uh, build very complex machines. Uh, at an incredibly affordable price with spectacular reliability. Right. And so when we looked at who we wanted to partner with to take this to the scale that it needs to go, uh, beyond the scale that aviation's ever uh, been done before, we selected Toyota as, as really an ideal partner. I was chatting with Alaska Air CEO Ben Minicucci earlier, 
and you know he's an engineer just like you and he, you know he has some skepticism about the use case for battery electric in in long distance flying in you know larger aircraft what's your take on that because you believe it's essential from a carbon standpoint from an environmental standpoint Absolutely right. And he's absolutely right. I've been working on uh, electric aircraft uh, since 1993. Okay. Uh, we've, we've had an order of magnitude improvement in the specific energy of batteries over that uh, period of time. But we have a real urgent problem that we need to solve today. Aviation is one of the uh, highest climate impact things we do on a daily basis. Right. And it's imperative that we reduce that environmental footprint. And electric propulsion is the solution. But battery electric only moves you, it's very valuable when you want to move across town or between cities that are close together. When we want to move around the planet, right. the solution is hydrogen electric. Hydrogen is three times higher specific energy than jet fuel. Well, that's why we talk about flying taxi. We put emphasis on that. There's also the use case. I know that you're focused on the flying taxi, but the big name in town is Walmart. You know, they're interesting. Talk to me about other use cases. Delivery, it's a possible avenue, right? Yeah, so uh, we're very excited about moving people across town, but there's also a really valuable use case in uh, moving goods. And we have an amazing partnership with the DoD uh, where we are significantly reducing their operating costs, okay. uh, significantly uh, uh, improving uh, reliability, and uh, making it possible for them to, to move goods around on bases around the U.S., people around bases in the U.S. Uh, in, a, in a much more efficient okay, way. So that's, that's a government relationship that that's, could be lucrative for you. When are you going to be meaningfully revenue generating? You know, give me a real timeline for when this is a substantive business. So it, we are going to build this slowly. Okay. This doesn't. We're not going to be able to turn it on in uh, cities around the world on day one. Again, today okay. we're building tens of aircraft. Uh, in the next few years, we'll right. be able. To, we'll have the capacity to build hundreds of aircraft. Uh, over the arc, we need. Uh, orders of magnitude more aircraft than that All right. uh, in order to really bring this vision to life of being able to move people, uh, allow people to live where they want to live, work where they want to work. And uh, this, this is, if, if you think of back, back through the, right. the, the epochs of, of history, as we moved from uh, walking to riding horses to the railroad and automobiles, they reshaped our civilization. And you think it will do it this time. I'm sorry to cut you off, Joe Ben. We, we always need more time. That's Joe Ben Bevitt, CEO of Joby Aviation M. A fascinating conversation. He's going to take me for a ride. He's promised me. All right. Ed, you'll have to keep us posted on how that goes. Thank you. Tomorrow, I know you're going to be sitting down with ARK Invest CEO Kathy Wood to talk about her vision for the future of mobility and more. You don't want to miss Ed's interview later this week. Coming up, I am joined by one of the top cybersecurity officials in the Biden administration, Kirsten Todd. What are the biggest cyber threats facing the U.S. right now? How prepared are we? She joins us next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. One of the biggest threats to the United States could be its lack of modern technology inside the government, in part due to bureaucracy. From expanding AI capabilities for the military to beefing up cybersecurity, there's a very real concern that the U.S. has fallen behind in the tech race. My next guest and others working in the Biden administration are trying to fix that. Joining me now, Kirsten Todd. She's the chief of staff at CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. It's great to see you in person after you, interviewing <laughs> you remotely for years. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you. So look, there's this new Pentagon AI chief who wants to crack the bureaucratic inertia when it comes to some of these issues. How would you rate how modernized U.S. technology to fight some of these threats is at this moment, and how much better do you want it to be? Well, I think when we look at where we are, we're always assessing the legacy infrastructure, what we're working from, and where we're going. I think what's so critical about where the Biden administration is today is that you have leaders across the government, across agencies at DOD, the director of CISA, Jen Easterly, Chris Inglis, the national cyber director, 
who all appreciate the value and the need to bring technology, modern day technology into government. And there are so many efforts that have been legislated over the last year that really enforce and encourage that spending to bring that technology. We know that government can't secure the nation or industry by itself. We've got to be working together to identify the right technologies and bring them in. And we've seen a lot of efforts that are actually creating the resources and an enormous amount of money. Um, CISA has a budget now of over $2 billion with the newly appropriated funds to bring that technology in to modernize government and to keep it evolving to where the threats are. Last I heard there was 500,000 open jobs in cybersecurity. Is that for real? And what are the consequences of that, that all of those jobs aren't being filled? So I would even say that the number's more, because when really? we look- how, how much more? <laughs> well, I think when we look at cybersecurity jobs, everybody is part of the cyber workforce. Mm -hmm. And when we think about the accountability and responsibility that we have in cybersecurity, we all have that role. So I'm always hesitant to look at a specific number, because I think we've there are all these positions, but it also pigeonholes what a cyber workforce looks like. Mm -hmm. And I think we often think it's just math and science, but one of the things that we're very focused on at CISA is building out a diverse workforce, which isn't just about racial diversity, gender diversity, socioeconomic, but it's really looking at diversity of thinking and aptitudes. And I'm really excited that we're going to actually be launching um, the second neurodiversity pilot in the federal government where we're going to be bringing neurodiversity, neurodiverse individuals into the government to create a more inclusive workplace. With the ongoing war on Ukraine, how would you rate the level of cyber threats from Russia and others at this moment? Well, I think when we look at what's happened with Russia and the invasion of Ukraine, it's a marathon. We don't know where we are in the marathon, but this is a long-term battle. And I think as we see this, we have to appreciate what we've learned from this experience so far. One thing that CISA launched last August was the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative, which is about operational collaboration with industry, where we're partnering in real time with industry. We set up Slack channels, we uh, developed a plan, we exercised the plan, and now we're working not just with our industry partners in the United States, but actually with the Ukrainian CERT, which is the Computer Emergency Response Team. They've given us information, we share that with our industry partners, and we're able to see a much better profile and threat picture than we've ever been able to see before. Some critics say that the war on Ukraine has caught the U.S. government flat-footed when it comes to cyber and that we're seeing the shifting of responsibility to the private sector. How would you respond to that? So criticism? I actually would disagree with that um, pretty strongly <laughs> because actually in November we put out something called Shields Up in anticipation of a potential invasion where we asked industry to do several things. We said lower the threshold for reporting to government. We said empower your CISOs. Look at things like multi-factor authentication. And what we've heard from industry CISOs across the board is that that was actually a very helpful tool because it gave them a heads up on not what the specific threat was going to be, but the need to create resiliency within these industry partners. There's an effort to scale up and broaden membership in the JCDC. Mm -hmm. How is that effort going? And you know, what would you like to see the role of that part of the organization be ultimately? Well, I think for those of us that have been in this space for so long, you know, the term public-private partnership lost its meaning. And so what we're seeing with operational collaboration is this real-time threat and information sharing. So when we look at building this out, we're building it out to where the threat has been. So for example, with Russia, Ukraine, we brought in uh, financial institutions. We brought in the energy sector because those are where we had greatest concerns about the threats. So I think this is one of these very deliberate, dynamic processes to bring in the right industry partners as we're moving out. So what do you think businesses still need to do that they're not doing enough of yet? So what we'd love to see, I think, is important is to institutionalize the Shields Up approach, so these efforts about lowering the threshold for reporting and being able to empower CISOs. But importantly, I think we are at a place now where we need to ensure that security is innovation, that secure innovation is the next step, where security is a differentiator. We talk a lot about baking security into products. That would go a long way right now, but the ability to see security as a positive effort. You know, to, if we start to see startups take on security as something that's an advantage and starting to make the business case for why to build this in, I think we'll see a lot of progress. And then I have to make a plug for multi-factor authentication. We launched our multi-factor authentication campaign this week. We're calling it more than a password, just getting everybody to take that on. The only other piece that I'll, I'll mention is that organizations focus so much on their own security, which is critical, mm -hmm. but now we have a responsibility with the increased threat landscape to really secure the digital ecosystem, look at small businesses and other elements so that we can raise the resilience 
of both the public and private sector. All right, Kirsten Todd of CISA, thank you so much for joining us. Good to see you. Great to see you, Emily. In thank person. you. Thank you. Kirsten is one of the many featured speakers at our Bloomberg Tech Summit tomorrow. Again, that starts noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. We're going to be talking about cybersecurity, gaming, travel, crypto, e-commerce, and a whole lot more. Coming up, a look at crypto ETFs. How are they faring against the wider crypto winter? We'll discuss. This is Bloomberg. Time now for our crypto report and a look at crypto linked ETFs, which are overrepresented in the industry's worst performing list so far this year. Our crypto contributor, Shanali Basik, here with more. Shanali, explain what's happening here. Yeah, what's interesting to me, Emily, is that when you look at the decline in Bitcoin, which is a little over 30% on the year, and you look at what's happening in the ETF world, which are often tied to stocks, tied to Bitcoin, the performance is actually much, much worse, sometimes in case almost twice as bad. Bloomberg's Credit Greifeld found that the six worst performing non-leveraged ETFs were all tied to crypto companies. So what does that mean? Global X blockchain down 64% this year. VanEck Digital Transportation with the ticker DAPP down 63% uh, this year. Again, nearly double what you're seeing in Bitcoin itself and nearly double what you're seeing in the likes of Bitcoin futures ETFs like BITO, so B-I-T-O. So they, again, they're holding the likes of Coinbase, Riot Blockchain, Marathon Digital, Galaxy Digital. We've talked about this before. The equities that are trading uh, alongside Bitcoin have seen a bigger drop off this year in many regards, and that's what you're seeing in the ETFs. All right, Shanali, thanks for that update. I want to talk about all that and more with Matthew Ball, managing partner at Apillion Co. and Matt Hogan, CIO at Bitwise Asset Management. Both of you are out with your own news together, launching a new index fund along with Multicoin Capital. Matthew, I'll start with you. Tell us more about this new fund and how it works. Sure. So the goal with the new fund was really to provide qualified purchasers an opportunity to invest in a diverse expertly constructed thematic index of crypto tokens, 40 specifically, that are consistent with the metaverse theme. Our goal was to take a look at the entire ecosystem, focus on bona fide, liquidity, tested, stress-tested securities, and to provide yet another diversified access path to a multi-trillion dollar investment opportunity. So, uh, Matt, the fund is only open to qualified purchasers. How do you identify those? Sure. Great question, Emily. Qualified purchasers are individuals in the U.S. that have five million or more in liquid assets. So this is one corner of the market. A big story about crypto is it's often cracked open the market in these areas before it's expanded. The metaverse is obviously a very exciting and very early opportunity, and that's why it's most appropriate for this qualified purchaser market. Eventually, we'd love to open it up more broadly, but that's where we are today. Now, Matthew, your Metaverse ETF, which we've talked a lot about, is down almost 40% so far this year. Yes, so much of the market is down. But, you know, why should investors think that this ETF is the right call? Well, I think the perspective on the MetV ETF is it's about 39% down year to date. That compares to about 29 or 30% for the triple Qs, a reflection of the fact that we are over-indexed to growth companies commensurate with the expectation that over the coming decade, Goldman Sachs, Citi, Morgan Stanley estimate that between 8 and 13 trillion in annual GDP will come from this sector. That's 40% of the digital economy's growth and 15% of the world economy. Over-indexing to growth is often a good play. Year to date, it has proven not to be. As relates to this specific product, I see it as yet another asset class that to many, ourselves included, believe is essential. I'm an early stage and late stage private investor. The ETF is designed for public markets exposure, and this product is designed for the cryptocurrency and blockchain environment. So this is really a bet you see on the future. Matt, how do you see this fund evolving, let's say, five years from now? Oh, I think it's going to be a very big deal. You know, if you talk about the metaverse and you don't look one year out or two years out, but five years or 10 years out, I think a lot of people feel confident that our immersion in the digital world is going to increase. And that's going to mean that these assets, which are really the core infrastructure on which an open metaverse will be built, 
should grow, should become common names, and we should get more and more assets in the fund. So we're very early in this opportunity. I suspect five years from now, this will be, as Matt said, a much larger asset class. These assets will be much more familiar, but investors do have the opportunity to access them today. They're able to get in early on this decade-long mega trend. So uh, I would love to get your thoughts, Matt, on, on the crypto winter that just seems to be ongoing and co colder on some days than others. We can't seem to, uh, Bitcoin can't seem to break out of this $30,000 route. You know, where is this going? How long does it last? Yeah, I think what we've seen is a macro-induced crypto winner. We've seen a rewriting of all growth investments, and that includes crypto. If you look under the hood, the sort of fundamentals of crypto continue to be strong. Venture capital activity is strong. Developer activity is strong. New projects and launches are strong. Companies like Coinbase are doing interesting things. So underneath the surface, all this great activity is going on. We need the macro markets to normalize, and then you'll see the impact of that fundamental progress. I suspect we still have a few months to go before those macro markets normalize, but once they do, at least historically, what you've seen is crypto rebound aggressively because the underlying trends are just so positive, and that continues to be true in this market. You know, Matthew, it can be hard for investors to believe in, in this view of the future, whether it is crypto or the metaverse. The Queen Jubilee was this week. We saw a hologram of the queen in a carriage, you tweeted about it. How do you see this as a, you know, an indication of where the metaverse and some of these future technologies are headed? The monarchy-verse, as you say. <laughs> I think the most important thing is to recognize that the advent of graphics-based computing, using 3D simulation to solve problems that previously were outside of our reach, while also recognizing that younger generations in particular, I grew up using text, my identity was reflected by an email address and a message board username, slowly grew into more and more multimedia, more live experiences. And now we see through Roblox, Minecraft and others, an entire new generation, Gen Z, that is reflecting themselves through 3D objects, 3D avatars, existing in 3D space. The confluence of gra graphics-based computing on the industrial side mixed with societal and behavioral changes among younger demographics, bolstered by new technological paradigms such as blockchain and imminent XR hardware, gives me confidence in what's around the corner. Holograms and holography, a field that we previously believed was just for Star Trek and the Jetsons, is actually imminent. We're going to see it deployed globally in retail stores over the coming years. All right. We'll be watching. Matthew Ball, Apillion Co., Matt Hogan, Bitwise Asset Management. Good to have you both. We'll keep our eyes on your ETF. Coming up, Apple getting into buy now, pay later. What does it mean for Affirm and other competitors? I'll ask Affirm CEO Max Levchin next in an exclusive interview. This is Bloomberg. Apple Pay Later lets you split the cost of an Apple Pay purchase into four equal payments spread over six weeks with zero interest and no fees of any kind. And Apple Pay Later is available everywhere Apple Pay is accepted, in apps and online. That was Apple. They're officially unveiling its new Buy Now Pay Later service, Apple Pay Later, allowing customers to split purchases through Apple Pay with four payments, interest-free, over six weeks. That announcement initially caused shares of a firm, which offers a similar service to fall, but they've rebounded. Joining me now exclusively in this week's edition of Techonomics is a firm CEO and co-founder, Max Levchin. So Max, there's a big question of what this means for a firm and other uh, BNPL services. We want to know how big your moat is. A firm has lined up big merchants that are, you know, very much embedded in what you offer, like Walmart, Amazon, major airlines, Shopify. Will Apple be able to penetrate all these merchants? So, first of all, thank you for listing out our moats. Uh, <laughs> I think they are quite significant. Just as importantly, and that's really not what, why I'm not particularly worried about Apple Pay entering the buy now pay later space. They're focused on the convenience of a six week product, which I think is great. And there's plenty of competitors and they should be worried. I think uh, this uh, spells certain level of concern for folks that are really specialized in this really short term product. We spent 10 years building out 
technology, data, partnerships, integrations, really, really good underwriting models so that we can offer consumers plans from six weeks to 60 months. That is unique and different and special. And it involves not just data and underwriting, also involves capital partnerships, figuring out how to manage capital markets in you know, rising interest rate environments, et cetera. So we feel very, very good about just the sheer complexity of what we do protects us really well. That said, I'm genuinely excited for two reasons about Apple Pay Later. One, they chose the right thing by consumers. The no late fees, no gimmicks, no tricks, no fees of any kind. That's a really the right message. And it sends the right statement to the rest of the world. Credit cards, frankly, have some real competition and it's great to, to hear companies powerful as Apple say that out loud that there's a better alternative. And uh, part two, I think just telling the world, telling the consumer that this is a thing, this is a thing that's better than your credit card, including perhaps Apple's own credit card is, is great. So we feel like this creates a really nice uh, tailwind for us. But Apple does have a huge potential base of 1 billion iPhone users. That has to be too big for even the largest merchants to ignore. How do you think about that? I mean, are you, are you preparing for a cut of what, you know, a firm now gets and, you know, buy now, pay later requests to go to Apple? You know, I think in the world of true zero sum, maybe that would have been a concern, but just for context in the US, buy now, pay later is, I believe, sub 5% of e-commerce and of commerce overall, it's really tiny. I don't think there's much concern. When PayPal announced their entry into the space also was the six weeks product. I think everyone was sort of holding their breath a little bit. And we'd stated at the time that this just isn't going to register in our world because there's just so much ground to cover. We're all competing with credit cards and credit cards are competing with cash. There's a lot of room to grow for all involved. So no, not concern at all. I have to ask about your broader view on the macro environment. Elon Musk says he has a super bad feeling about the economy. Tesla laying off 10%. Klarna, a buy now, pay later competitor. Uh, again, maybe not apples to apples, but they're laying off 10%. How do you feel about the economy? Does a firm have any layoffs or hiring freezes planned? We're not just not laying off, sorry for the double negative, we're actually hiring. Um, I think laying off is, you know, no, no comment on Elon, he, he's got feelings that I, I only wish I could match. But I think in my world, when you feel the need to hire, that means you haven't done the necessary thinking and working in the past. And so we are hiring because we have real needs to grow the product, to build new things, to deliver value to consumers and merchants. Most importantly, right now, as the economy teeters on, you know, who knows, recession, downturn, whatever it is, it's not, you know, it's going to get worse before it gets better. We have a mission to deliver spending power in a responsible way to consumers and to improve the top line and growth of our merchant partners. And we take it very, very seriously. We're gearing up for time to shine, for growth, for new products, new ways of delivering value. And that's why we need more people. There's certainly no, uh, no, no, no time to rest for us. We have a lot of work to do. A, a key word you just used there is responsible. We are hearing more and more stories of especially long, young people getting in trouble with buy now, pay later. Are you doing more to warn some of your potential customers about the risks of taking out a number of, of small different loans and the longer term impact it could have. I mean, as we've talked about, this has drawn the scrutiny of regulators. First of all, I mean, I've said it before, but I'll repeat it. I think it's really important that the regulators understand how this particular flavor works. I think as they dig in deeper, they will see that this is a better product than a credit card, simply because credit cards essentially allow you to refinance your own debts in perpetuity, which is not that different from payday lending. And so I think it's really, really important that regulators see what buy now pay later can do, which I wholeheartedly believe is a healthier consumer product. Two, it is really important for consumers to understand when they're overextended. The underlying reason why we chose to never charge late fees was that we are permanently aligned with the borrower. If the borrower is late, banks and credit cards make more money. That is a bad misalignment of interest, especially in a downturn. We don't make a penny if consumers can't pay us back. If they're late, we just have to find a way of not making the mistake again, basically. And so this lack of late fees is a really powerful motivator for us to design products and to approve only as far as we believe people will pay us back. And that's one side of it. The other side is you have to help people build their credit history. A firm has always reported the industry slang as furnished information to the bureaus specifically so that consumers can 
build their history with a credit bureau. So majority of my competitors don't do that. I think it's a really, really important social mission and we're very committed to that as well. So we feel like we're doing a okay. lot to be on the right side here and we'll certainly do more. Max Lepchin, CEO and co-founder of Affirm. Thanks for joining us so quickly on the back of that Apple announcement. Appreciate hearing your perspective. And that does it for this edition of the show. We've got a huge day tomorrow, the Bloomberg Technology Summit is happening. The theme is looking forward. Andy Jassy, the CEO of Amazon. Dara Khosrowshahi at Uber. Takedra Mawakana of Waymo, the CEO of MasterCard as well.